Hey there, welcome back to Coding at Home. Hey there, I'm Matt with the Code Hub. Welcome back to Coding at Home. Today we're going to work on some augmented reality in Swift Playgrounds. Um, we've been playing a lot with Reality Composer over the last couple of weeks and doing some, building some pretty interesting uh, 3D augmented reality scenes. We're going to spend our time today on Swift Playgrounds. Of course, next week will be our last session before WWDC and the big keynote where they're going to talk about what's coming up next and give us a little preview of the week sessions. Um, should be really entertaining. Well, I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about following those sessions. Um, but today we're just going to dive right back into Swift Playgrounds and set up an augmented reality scene. So let's, let's go over to the iPad. All right, so here we are. We're going to go, like I mentioned, we were playing around with Reality Composer a ton over the last few weeks. We built some really interesting scenes. Um, we posted a link to one of our students' uh, domino games that you can play with. It, it's best played in a, a sort of large open space because you do a lot of walking around. Uh, the goal is to tap on a marble and it goes and knocks down a bunch of dominoes. It looks amazing. Um, it's really beautifully done. The colors are great. And um, it, it goes through a few different scenes. So there's actually a lot of work on the behaviors uh, and the objects that were placed in this particular uh, reality composer scene. Well worth checking out. We'll have a link in the video. But today we're going to play with Swift Playground. So let's open that up. Now we're going to start back at the beginning with a little refresher. So, you know, what is augmented reality? It's filling that physical world around us through the, the camera in the iPad or the phone uh, with these virtual objects that we build. So in this case, in the case of this playground, we're going to have things like snails. Uh, we'll have rain clouds that we saw a little bit uh, in yesterday's session. And there's a really easy way for us to play around with this very quick and out of the box is just by using this do something whimsical function. So if we hit run my code, that do something whimsical function actually does a whole ton of stuff for us. It figures out, um, it, it detects different feature points in our environment and it gives us an option to tap anywhere to place our object. You can see our lemon is floating above our desk. We hit start scene. And we get this cool animation feature here with the drops splashing off the top of the surface. So that's very cool. With one line of code, we were able to generate this scene. Now, there's a lot of work that went into the code behind the scenes. In fact, they tell us to take a look at shared code. And we can see that here's our do something whimsical function. As you might remember from our Lights, Camera, Code playgrounds and uh, the App at Home playgrounds, we have to define it as public because it's in a separate file to our, our main source file here. This bookmark icon being our main one, the thing that gets run when we hit Run My Code. So in the shared code file, we have this function here, do something whimsical. We have a property, you know, so a variable that's going to be a constant called lemon that we assign a model.lemon to. We add the lemon to the scene. We have this on start handler function where we tell the lemon to animate and we give it a dot juice property as, as one of the animation properties we want it to, um, to show. And then we have a, a, a repeat, we tell it to repeat in a loop. We also have another action here where we, uh, the action we're performing is this dot rotate by, and then we tell it to rotate around the Y axis by 20 every single time. And then we have a place of music. Now I, we're not hearing the music cause I don't have the audio turned on for the video, but you probably hear this around your house. We see some other things like a function embedded inside a function. That's kind of interesting. That's why this is a, an intermediate playground. We're starting to use more advanced organization techniques here. 
we have another function in there called a, a lemon flying where the lemon speaks to text there's a lemon it's flying all right that's interesting this is one of our other functions we could use we could do this do something mysterious so let's go back to main and let's change the function that we use so let's hit the main tab in fact it gives us a hint here say trust and it says try changing do something whimsical to do something friendly let's let's do that so we'll just delete down here we get in our autocomplete bar we have an option to do something friendly or mysterious so let's do something friendly and let's run our code So there we go, we've detected our, our feature points and we can see the lines. This is a whole bunch of new animations we're seeing when we're trying to place our, our object. Let's place that there. We have another eye to place, so let's place it over there. And then we have some text that says, look into my eyes. All right, let's place that maybe behind the eyes. And we're gonna start the scene Okay, cool. We can look into the eyes. Kind of interesting. And there we go. We've got a smiley face and a nose as well. Kind of cool. So something we didn't try when we ran through this, this particular page before was we didn't try running multiple versions of these functions. So let's, so we have do something friendly. Let's try when the autocomplete bar comes up. Actually, I'm going to encourage it by hitting delete and then hitting return again. So I just hit the delete key here and then I hit return. So now I have the option to either drop a, another function or a reference to my scene here in, in my code editor. Let's try doing something mysterious after doing something friendly and let's see what happens let's run our code okay cool it gets us set up sets up all right so it looks similar to what we just did we'll place the eyes maybe back here place our second eye back there we'll put look into my eyes in front this time oh and now we get to place our hand from the do something mysterious function We'll put the come closer, maybe a little bit further away. So now we have look into my eyes. We have come closer. We have the, the creepy looking hand and the eyes. Let's start our scene. You can see how it kind of just floats there in space and we we're able to place that with this particular function. We'll get up close to our hand and you can see the animation changes when we get up close to it and it says are you paying attention i guess we're paying attention now oh and we've got quite a few other items popping into existence there There's a moon, there's a nose, I think. That is an, like a pool noodle, snail. All right, quite a few things. I'm not sure if that was the do something mysterious or do something friendly. I'm guessing it might be the mysterious because we didn't see that when we just had our do something friendly. All right. So this is our, this is the start of our augmented reality journey in Swift Playgrounds. Uh, I do like this because we, we can go, kind of go back over this and refresh our memory about what feature points are. And we, it talks about the several small dots we see on the scene when we try to detect our surfaces. And we can also read up about things like planes. And when we worked with Reality Composer, we worked a lot with horizontal planes, especially when we were doing the lunar lander exercises. And then another plane that we had was the, the plane of a, a book cover. When we had the image anchor 
attached to a, a picture of the, the book cover. All right, so let's move on. Now that we've placed our, our stuff and we've even used a different function, let's, let's hit the arrow here to go to our next scene. So I'm going to reset this page so we can kind of start over from scratch. So let's hit, I'm going to go, I hit the three dots. I'm going to go hit reset page. If this is your first time coming to this page, you'll have the same, you'll have, your code will look just like this. We have a couple of comments saying create a model, add your model to the scene, and then animate our model. And if you were working with us over the last couple of days, you might have an array of models that we loop through to add them to the scene. But let's, let's try adding our snail. So we have a good example here. We'll say, we'll create a var. We'll just call it model. And we have to assign it a value now. So the autocomplete bar is telling me that I can pick either scene or model. Model is what I want because model has these properties on it. And we access properties by hitting the dot. And now we can see all the properties on our model type. So let's pick a light bulb. And now we're going to add it to the scene. Because at this stage, we have a reference to a, a light bulb model. So we're going to add it to our scene by hitting going scene dot add. And there's also an option to do a set on start handler. That's already written for us down there. And this is what gets called when we press that start scene button. So let's do add. And we're going to add our model. And luckily it shows up in our autocomplete bar. So now let's animate our model. Because at this stage, if we just hit run our code and we take a look. All right, it's detected the flat surface so that I can see my light bulb. If I tap here, that places my light bulb. And I can circle around it. I can tap on it to reposition it. There's all this code that's been written for us that does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Now if I hit start scene, nothing happens. I lose the ability to tap to reposition the object, which I can get back to. I can get back to that state by hitting this button up here, this grid button will let me tap on the object to reposition it. But start scene doesn't do anything very exciting yet. So let's animate our, our light bulb. So the way we would animate it, and you can see here that they just call the model dot animate method. And that'll, that'll, determine what the model does when we hit that start scene button. So let's do that. Let's say, bring up our keyboard, just tapped on the arrow over here. And I'll show you again, tapped on this arrow here and it brings up the keyboard. And now I can start typing model. I'm going to call the method by using dot notation. So dot, and I have an option of three different. I have a property location and I know this is a property because there's no parentheses after the name. There's this method disappear. And then there's this other method animate. So let's tap on animate. And now let's try running our code and see what the light bulb does. All right, there's our light bulb. We're going to drop it right there on the desk. We'll hit start scene. Okay, so for the light bulbs animation, it goes up and down. Looks like a pogo stick because it kind of hits the ground and depresses that end bit there. It's kind of cool. Well, let's try a different model and see what animation that might have. So let's try a, we're going to delete light bulb and we are going to pick one of these. So once I deleted that, I'm at the end of the dot. So it's saying model dot and then it gives me the autocomplete options. So let's pick the moon and see if that's got an interesting animation property. Let's hit run my code. That's all I changed was the, the type of model that we're 
saving in our our variable. Let's drop the moon there. Let's hit start. Okay, the moon is kind of similar to the light bulb. Now it doesn't touch down on the ground, but it does raise up and down. Okay, let's try another one that's maybe a little more interesting. Let's try the lemon. So if I hit run my code now, so I haven't changed any other code, I've just picked a different model. We'll hit run my code. We'll place a lemon. Now we saw the lemon in the first one when we, when we ran the function do something whimsical. And there it is again, same lemon. Let's hit start scene and see what we see. Okay, cool. So when we, we animate the lemon just by default, we see it, it kind of pops and then spins a bit. But we saw it do something else. It kind of rained down um, lemon draw, lemon juice when, when uh, we ran the animation function before, when we ran do something whimsical. If we look at the shared code, and this is a great way to learn about different capabilities of different frameworks and, and just to see how other coders have done it. We can see that they use a different animate method here. So they pass in a property called dot juice, and then they pass in another parameter called repeats, and they pass in dot loop. Let's, let's try doing that. Let's go back to our main code here. And let's try changing what animate method we use. And in fact, you take a look now, I started to delete a few of the characters here and I have an animate method, but I also have this other animate method. So if, let's tap on that one. So it's asking for a lemon model dot animation. Well, how do I know what kind of animations are on a lemon model type. Well, let's, let's hit this type, or this type. <laughs> let's hit this uh, period here in autocomplete. And okay, if I hit period, it tells me that it's got a, a juice type of animation. Let's hit juice. And let's try running that. Now I used autocomplete to figure out what additional animation, what, what properties I might have on my lemon model. If I hit start scene. Okay, cool. There's my, my lemon juice coming out. That's kind of cool. So the way we figured it out was by using the autocomplete bar down here. So when we typed in the dot, we, we let, we, we tapped autocomplete and we got a few sort of new methods to call. And then we, we hit the dot that it had suggested and it gave us an option of juice to run as an animation. The other way we could find out what a, a lemon model might provide to us is by going up to the, the source for this. So let's hit the files button here. And I can see feet, I can see roses, I can see shared code. I don't think I have the lemon model in here. But if we were really curious and we wanted to dig into it, we could go up to these three dots, go down to advance and pick this one, view auxiliary source files. So when we do that, we can see the structure of the guts of the Swift playground and the source code is kept in this contents folder. And the way this playground is organized, is it has some modules. So let's open up modules. And we have a book playground module. And what this is, is this is a collection of, if we tap on sources, a collection of source files that can, that are access accessible for this Swift playground and that we can use the code from many of these source files. So if we look, we can see there's an imodel.swift. Actually, let's tap on that and check it out. Now I can't see the source code, so I have to tap on the pane over here, the editor over here, and then my pane goes away. So we can see that we have a, a class and it's public. Final, we'll get into that another day. But it's the type is called iModel. 
And it's got, it implements a few of these things. You know, we talked about super classes before. This is like that, sort of. We have a few properties here. Particle size, particle color. We have an identifier for this. We have a scheme. Okay, color array. If we keep scrolling, we can see that there's a, an animation in um. It's another Swift type that if, especially if you go into app development with Swift, you'll learn a lot about enums. It's basically just a way for you to define a certain set of values uh, that a yeah, class might provide and say, oh, well, instead of having someone type in, look left, look right, or cry, we let the Swift compiler help us out by providing these predefined values like look left, look right, and tier. We have a public function called appear. We have one called disappear. We have an animate function here where we accept an animation, an imodel.animation. So it's one of these. So it's imodel.animation will be one of look left, look right tier. And when we get into our more advanced Swift, which we can do in Swift Playgrounds, we'll talk a little bit more about organizing our code and using enums to provide this kind of value. But you can see there's a ton of code written here just for our I model. This isn't even a generic model. This is our, our I model specifically. So it's not even talking about the, um, the lemon model. So if I go up here and I hit this arrow, I'll bring back the source code and let's go let's find that lemon model so we'll scroll down through the list there's the light bulb model snail model an action class that might be kind of interesting rain cloud model and way down at the bottom is this lemon model let's tap on that and again once i select it i have to tap on the text editor here So again, just like our I model, there's, you know, it says public final class lemon model. There's a colon, so it tells you the type that it is. And there's a whole list of things that the lemon model conforms to. That just means that it behaves like each one of those types. There's again, this identifier emitter offset scheme, some other stuff that we won't worry about for right now, particle color. And you can see here is our lemon model dot animation. And you can see that there's only one case. So in the I model, we had a few different ones, look left, look right, and then tier. In this case, we only have one for a lemon model and that's juice. So that's the only animation that we're going to support. So and then, of course, you can see down here, there's a few other things. We use a thing called Scene Kit, uh, which is a really powerful 3D. Often you use it for games, but it's a nice 3D um, rendering framework uh, from Apple. Um, that's really handy to use when you're doing 3D uh, augmented reality scenes. So this is the guts of, of the Lemon model that we're using. If you're curious, you can play around with this. If not, you can happily just say, you know what, I'm done. I'm going back to here. I just want to be able to use this dot juice animation with my lemon. Now, just keep in mind, if you ever decide to say, oh, okay, I actually don't want this to be a lemon anymore. I'm going to make it a, uh, let's make it an alarm clock. Now, if I try to run my code, I'm going to run into a small problem. Because clock model dot animation has no member juice. Well, that leads me to believe that there is a clock model animation. So I might be able to pick from a few different ones. So let's start deleting. Let's fix this line by deleting from the end of this parentheses here. So we'll tap there and hit the delete key. So I have, I have an option. I could do animate or I could do animate clock model animation. The, this animate is available on all models. So it's a generic animation method that will pick a default method. Let's pick the, our clock one. 
Just like we saw with the lemon model, there's a dot here in the autocomplete. So let's hit the dot. And I can choose one of ring or tick. Maybe we'll pick tick. I have a feeling these are going to be sound based ones. So it's not going to be very exciting if I don't have my sound turned on. So let's hit run my code. We've detected our desk, we'll put the alarm clock back there. And now if we start our scene, okay, there's our tick. So if we go back and start a scene again. So that's our tick animation. It basically just the, the one hand on the, the alarm clock goes around once. Let's change that tick to ring. Let's run our code. You'll notice that as soon as we change any source code over here, we go from this where we have a stop button. So I'll place my alarm clock. I still have a stop button because I'm running the code that I just wrote. And I start the scene. Okay, that's it ringing. Now, as soon as I change any source over here, that stop button goes back to run my code. And this whole scene freezes. Because we've changed something, Swift now has to reevaluate all the code that we've written and figure out, okay, what is it I need to display over here? Because I may have said, oh, I don't want an alarm clock anymore. I want a lemon or I want a flying bug. All right, so we'll use our generic animation anyway. So if we ever decide to come back and change that alarm clock to a lemon, flying bug, what have you, um, everything will work just fine. So let's pull that up. Tap to place it. Let's start our scene. Okay, you can see our default animation is typically the object will pop a bit larger and then spin around on its y-axis. All right, let's try going on to the next page. So we're gonna go up here to the table of contents and we're gonna tap that next arrow. So now I'm gonna reset this. So we can try this out again. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use an action like this. This is telling the rain cloud to run this particular action. And the action is just gonna be an animation that we've defined somewhere. And by we, I mean some other developer has, has defined somewhere. So we have our rain cloud model, we have our snail model. We add the two of them to the scene. And then we, when the scene starts, we start to animate the rain cloud by having it rain. And now we're gonna use an action and move the rain cloud over to the snail. So let's, let's try that out. Now we have a good example up here. We need to call the run method on our rain cloud. So let's start by doing that. We'll go down to the autocomplete bar and hit rain cloud. Now we want to call the run method. So we'll use the dot notation. So dot, we could animate it again. Um, we can also access the rain clouds location. What we want to do though is run an action. And like we talked about a little bit yesterday, you can run a group of actions or a, a, another group of actions, but in sequence. So let's run just one action. So just like we saw with our animation for uh, lemon and for the alarm clock, we can we have a dot as the very first thing in our autocomplete bar. So let's tap on that. And this shows us a few different actions that we can run. So there's fade to, move by, move to, rotate by, and scale to. Well, the goal here is to move the rain cloud over to the snail's location. So let's do that. We'll do move to. Now you might remember the point type from the uh, lights, camera, code playgrounds. We can get a point from the location property on any one of our models. So what we want to do is move to the snail's location. So let's do that. Snail dot location, all from the autocomplete bar. 
And then the duration is how long it's going to take for us to get there. So we could put this to 100. We could put this to 2. We could put this to 1. If we put it to 2 or 1, or if we put it to 5, it'll take 5 seconds to get from wherever the rain cloud is over to the snail. So if it has to go a really long distance, it'll look like it's traveling much faster. And if it has to go a very short distance, it'll look like it's traveling much slower. Let's, let's try it out. Let's actually run this and see what it looks like. All right, we've detected our surface. We're going to put the cloud back there. And then the snail will put over here. And we are going to try to back up and try to get the two of them. All right, we'll start the scene. There's the snail. There's the rain cloud. We'll start the scene. It's animating by dropping rain. And you can see it move over there. It took about five seconds. And now it's raining on the poor snail. If we tap on the grid here, I'm going to reposition this. I'm going to redo it. So I'm going to actually open this up so I have more screen real estate. I'm going to reposition the cloud. So I tapped on the cloud. I'm actually going to put it right here. So now if I start the scene, it's moving much slower because it has much less distance to go. And it's going to take about five seconds to get to the location of the snail. Now, another thing we can play around with is, like I said, we can play around with the duration. Let's change that five to one. So wherever the rain cloud and the snail are, the rain cloud is going to try to move from its location to the snail's location within a second. Right, so here we go. We're going to tap the rain cloud over here. We'll put the snail maybe there. If we start the scene. So you can see it moves fairly quickly. Let's try repositioning our snail maybe near the, near the cloud if we start the scene. It still moves fairly quickly, not as quick as it did when they were much further apart. But this is really, really, this is an example of some of the great work that the engineers on the, the animation team have done to make sure uh, that they make things move smoothly across the screen, given a whole variety of parameters. So how far away the things are, how, how um, where you want something to move to, or whether you want it to scale whether you want the animation to be smooth or, or to, to ease in and then ease out or just ease out or just ease in. There's been a lot of work under the hood to get these animations here so smooth. All right, so I'm going to stop that. I'm going to actually go back over here. So once I expanded that, you can see that I've sort of got my... You can just see it, that arrow there. If I tap on that, it'll bring back my source code editor. If I ever want to just focus on the source code, I can actually go this thin bar here between the live view and the source code editor. If I tap this once and then tap the arrow that appears over here, I'll just see my source code like this. And you might want to do that if you're working on a lot of code. So now that we've got the, the rain cloud moving to the snail, what we're going to do on Monday is work on our distance events and see how we get on. If you want to keep playing around with this stuff, I would highly recommend maybe adding some more, creating some more uh, variables with other models in there, maybe additional snails. You'd have to name them something different. So, you know, snail one, snail two, if you have more than one snail. We did an experiment yesterday where we tried to add one particular model, one variable to the scene twice. And what happens is it basically just, you can position it and then you have to position it again. But you add a few more snails in here. What you can do is you can, or snails or rain clouds or light bulbs or whatever, you can use the add item contextual menu. If you tap on these braces, it'll let you add another item. 
Now I don't have anything called item, so I would, let's say, add a variable here. Let's call it lemon. And we'll just get a lemon from this model type dot lemon. Now, if I leave this and I try to run my code, I'm going to have an, an issue. So it tells me I need to fill in this placeholder. This grayed out text means that it's a placeholder. So I have to tap on it and I can just pick it from my autocomplete. I can pick lemon. And if I run my code, now what I'll see is I'll detect the surfaces. I'll drop a rain cloud. I'll drop my snail. And then I'll drop a lemon, maybe in between the two of them. And if I start my scene, the rain cloud books it over to the snail and sort of ignores the lemon because I'm not doing anything else with the lemon, just like I'm not doing anything with the snail. Now, one exercise I'd like, if, if you're interested and up for it, uh, I'd love to see you add some code in here in this on start handler where you have the snail move as well. So just like we use this run method on rain cloud to get the snail to move as well, you would do snail dot run. And if we hit the dot here, we'll see what type of actions are available to us. We can actually have the snail move by so much on the X, Y, or Z axis. And then we give it a duration. So how long it's going to take. But what the interesting piece that you could implement here and what we'll maybe show you how to implement on Monday is try to figure out how to get the snail to move by a certain amount and then have the rain cloud follow. So have the rain cloud always move to the snail's location. Like it's trying to get away from the rain. Give it a shot anyway. Uh, if you have any questions, shoot us a note at live at the codehub.ie or go to our discussions board. I hope you had fun today. We'll be back with more augmented reality and Swift Playgrounds on Monday. And um, yeah, until then, happy coding.